we're the number one obese nation in the world. The medical theory is that people are obese or overweight because they eat too much, they don't exercise enough. I mean, there's two fitness centers on every corner and every street now. And yet, we're the number one obese nation in the world. That's because obesity has nothing to do with lack of exercise or eating too much. His greatest impact on our world is just helping people understand the benefits of better nutrition. Dr. Wallach has always wanted his mission to be why you should understand that your foods do not carry all the nutritional supplementation that you believe they carry. The work that he has done for 50 years, it was based on the foundational, fundamental nutrients that your body needed. What the deficiencies of those nutrients actually meant and how they all tied together to create an entire pathology of disease and illness. Nothing changes in Dr. Wallach's mission. It is change the world through nutrition. If something is illegitimate, false, he calls it out, even if it means alienating the entire medical community. He doesn't care. He cares about the truth. He is so brilliant when it comes to nutrition and understanding nutrition and the need for supplementation at the cellular level. I realized when I was nine years old as a kid that nutrition played a great part in diseases that even doctors didn't know what to deal with. And that's how this all started. I had facial tics, little cramps in my face, and I'd squeak like a pig and make funny little noises. And it got worse and worse and worse by the time I was nine years old. I was truly disabled. And my mother took me to, quote, the best doctor. And she said, I can't find anything wrong with him. So the next day in school, everybody else went to lunch. I went to the library and I found a nursing book. So I just started in the index under A's and, and went through it. And it said it's a calcium deficiency. I had chores on the farm, including feeding some alfalfa pellets that were enriched to little bull calves, and I would read the little analysis tags on the back. And it had minerals, including calcium, and ran right to the barn and began to eat handfuls of these little alfalfa pellets myself. In two weeks' time, I was cured. And so when I was nine years old, I knew there was something to nutrition. When I graduated high school, I went to the University of Missouri. We got accepted into veterinary school first try. And by 1961, I was doing graduate work in pathology, doing autopsies on, on animals, uh, going for a PhD in pathology. He also studied comparative pathology, which meant comparing humans and, and animals and the pathology that uh, they either shared or didn't share. And back then, it was almost unheard of to be able to research back and forth between humans and animals and the, the things that they did share in terms of uh, environmental impact, uh, pollution, uh, diseases. And in 1961, I ran into the first um, recognized mass die-off in pollution in America. I'm only 21 years old, I'm a graduate student. I recognized it, did all the chemistries, got it prepared for publication, and uh, got it published. I gave Marlon Perkins, the old Mutual Omaha Wild Kingdom show, a copy of it. Because I had worked for him, he was a good friend and a mentor. Marlon Perkins was the, at that time, the zoo director of the St. Louis Zoo, and he mentored my father and helped him get into veterinary school. Because of his pathology and his veterinarian, he had a different way of looking thing at, at challenges that the average person didn't. That whole chronicle of education is very, very important to understand because once you understand that, then you understand why he talks about what he talks about. I needed to go to Africa in the White Rhino Conservation Projects. In the African Elephant Conservation Project, I don't know how long it's gonna take. They're rapidly disappearing because land was being gobbled up for farming and ranching and they require a lot of land for food. I went to um, South Africa on that project at the Shlishlui and Umflozi Game Reserve. Now, you have to figure out how to tranquilize these things, put the darts together, and we kind of crawled through the grass. I had to be within 10 yards to these 6,500-pound rhino that want to kill you. <laughs> and so I figured if I shot him in the rump, I could get him to run away, as opposed to shooting him in the front, then they charge it. I spent two years on that project, caught over 200 white rhino, about 50 black rhino, and over 100 African elephants. 
So if you see a white rhino in a zoo or a wild animal park, it's either one that I caught or offspring's one I caught. Today there's 10,000 white rhino in the world as opposed to 400 than there was back in 1965. I'm so very proud to have been in on saving the species. This was my middle daughter who was born in Africa. I delivered her out in the bush of Africa and this is a white rhino uh, pelvis uh, that she was uh, kind of sitting in just for something to think was kind of cute and laugh at. Catching rhino, catching elephant, living off of the wild game and fishing in Africa. It was just really a great life for a young fellow. I was prepared to stay there forever at that point. The heck with academics. Perkins sends me another letter and says, I've got a big grant from the National Institutes of Health to study pollution as a cause of birth defects and degenerative diseases, and you wrote the first paper in a mass tie off in America from pollution. The big zoos in the United States were going to use the, the zoos as the canary in the mine because there's bound to be a species at the zoo that's sensitive to pollution, like humans. And you'll do pathology and autopsies on humans as well as the animals. So I went back. Uh, to Washington University in St. Louis. This was called the Center for the Biology of Natural Systems. It was the St. Louis Zoo in 1967. It was a 10-year project. Did uh, 20,000 autopsies, 17,000 some change of over 454 species of zoo animals and 3,000 human beings. It turns out that pollution has nothing to do with causes. All deaths from natural causes are caused by nutritional deficiencies. But nobody had done 454 species until my project. What I found was that every vertebrate, whether you're a hummingbird or a, or a flamingo, or you're a turtle or a fish or an elephant, a rat, a dog, cat, pig, or a human being, all vertebrates require the same nutrients. 16 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 amino acids, three fatty acids. If they're deficient in the same nutrient, all vertebrates got the same deficiency disease. Nobody ever thought of that before. And that was the beginning of the science we now call epigenetics before there was the word. These 20,000 autopsies and all these chemistries and slides went into a 1,200-page book that sold for 140 bucks back then. It had never been a book like it before. The disease of exotic animals, of course, is one of my great treasures because it represented the 10 years of actual work. It was in the Smithsonian Institute as a national treasure. Back then, zoos did not have full-time zoo veterinarians, and so my father uh, trained the first full-time zoo veterinarian at the St. Louis Zoo, Dr. Bover, who he, my father and Dr. Bover late, later wrote the book Diseases of Exotic Animals together. And my father's whole idea was to create an information clearinghouse. That was the very first book ever written to be shared by zoos and vets all over the country. This is before computers. This is before the web. But I moved to Chicago and worked as a pathologist at the uh, Brookfield Zoo and, and Lincoln Park Zoo, the Shedd Aquarium. Uh, moved from there to the Jacksonville Zoo and the uh, Memphis Zoos as a pathologist. My father's impact in terms of, of helping animals and his passion around zoos was expanding on the idea of open air zoos. In the early 1900s into the mid 1900s, zoos were really places that had cages and caged animals. My father's work and impact had a lot to do with creating these open air zoos, which you see today. A great example of that is the San Diego Wild Animal Park, where the animals roam free and where the animals didn't know they were actually caged. Growing up with my father obviously was was interesting. You know, as a, a young boy, we would move from city to city and initially zoo to zoo. I kind of thought it was normal. I thought everybody grew up in zoos. You know, I kind of had free reign and free run, a variety of zoos. I knew everybody, everybody knew me. I was, you know, this young little kid, Dr. Wallach's son. And so it was fun growing up, uh, you know, around the zoos. I was approached to go to Atlanta, Georgia and work at the Yerkes Primate Center with the primate colony there that uh, NASA was working with to send monkeys into space and so forth. Marlon Perkins put my father on this path early on. That's ultimately what led to my father making the discovery many, many years later of cystic fibrosis, working as a assistant pathologist at the Yerkes Primate Center, uh, doing research on primates in particular to further uh, human science and human health. And ultimately, that's what changed my father's direction really uh, towards human health. There was always that piece behind me looking for more information. Yerkes had many, many things. There was five of these uh, regional primate centers scattered around the United States. And this particular one in Atlanta, Georgia, the Yerkes Regional Primate Center, was being used to train and raise monkeys for NASA for space travel. And again, it was my first um, year there. 
was wintertime. All the people who'd been there for 15, 20 years left for the holidays. I'm the new guy on the block. I get left there by myself. Here it comes. I get a six month old baby monkey. Came from a colony of 25 baby monkeys, all with different mothers and fathers. So they're not genetically related whatsoever. For six years, before that monkey died, every month, the parents, the mother and father of each of these baby monkeys, they would take a blood sample and put it in the freezer. So I had six years worth of monthly blood samples from the parents of these 25 monkeys. I mean, how perfect is that? Did everything, found the one nutrient that was missing. Hadn't been missing in the other ones before this group, but after this group, that nutrient was missing. That's why these monkeys got cystic fibrosis. It's the first non-human case of cystic fibrosis ever diagnosed in a primate, or any animal for that matter. I mean, I was excited because this is really gonna help us the research to help kids with cystic fibrosis. So I had this paper all ready to go, had all the data, I had all my microscopic pictures, I had all the chemistries that I'd done, all those saved blood samples, I had the biopsies from the 24 living ones. I got it all prepared, I'm so excited. I took it to the head of the Yerkes Primate Center, and then I took it to the head of the medical school at the Emory University there. I said, I'm ready for publication here, I want you to review everything. And they fired me. <laughs> because they said, oh, it's a false series. When my father discovered this case of cystic fibrosis, anything to do with, with animal research was a, a hot potato, and anything to do with primate research was an extra, you know, uh, hot potato. <laughs> and my father's discovery and belief back then, which is the same today, is that what led to the, the death of that infant monkey and led to cystic fibrosis occurring in that monkey was a nutritional deficiency. They didn't know what they didn't know and they were feeding them a traditional diet of monkey biscuits and saturated oils and things like that. And my father's point was that the monkey in question and others, uh, were, they were deficient in key nutrients, selenium being one of them, vitamin E and riboflavin being others. Information is, is power. He wanted the world to know this information. They wanted to keep that quiet. And so, or it seemed. My father was willing to tell anybody. You know, he was, he was driving the, uh, the media attention to get this message out, to get the story out, to get the information out. Wallach claims he discovered cystic fibrosis in the organs of a dead monkey while working two years ago here at the Yerkes Primate Research Center in Atlanta. Proper selenium levels in her diet. We can, if we're correct, we then we'll be able to prevent what is called cystic fibrosis. So is he a radical rebel with a cause? Without a doubt, and he's the best one at it. Dr. Wallach has really um, put himself in a position to take on a lot of arrows. He wasn't worried about popularity. He wasn't worried about what other people thought. What he was most concerned about is um, how he could impact people and do the right thing and just simply tell the truth. He has this belief and this knowledge, 50 years of scientific research. And I already know for sure, I don't care if he gets knocked down another 20 times, he will get up that 21st time. I've seen my father deal with a, a lot of blows that would cause most people to just curl up in a ball and quit. And when he discovered uh, this case of cystic fibrosis, uh, he had four kids and my father was married to my first stepmother and she wound up dying at that time of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It was devastating to him. He made this major discovery and he was excited and then fired it for it. And so they took you know, all that away from him and he was faced with having to support us four kids, bury his wife, and move forward. That's when ultimately within a year, I knew I had to become a physician so I could treat these kids because they weren't gonna do it. There is a disconnect with the medical system. The medical system has failed us very badly. Uh, they believe your genes are gonna do their thing regardless of what you eat or don't eat. They think if you have bad genes, your bad genes are gonna do what they're gonna do regardless of what you eat and what you don't eat. Well, in the animal industry, we were able to show very clearly that um, I could take a animal with type two diabetes and give them the nutrients and in weeks it'd be gone. I've been doing the same thing in human beings for over 40 years now as a naturopathic physician. In order to become a naturopathic physician, you have to do four years of pre-med, four years of naturopathic medical school, uh, about a thousand hours of clinical supervision. You have to pass national boards, you have to pass state boards, you have to secure a license to practice medicine and pursue continuing education credit every year. However, the distinction between naturopathic medicine and what MDs practice, which is allopathic medicine, 
is that naturopathic physicians are taught therapeutics, the intention of which are to cure the condition. Allopaths, MDs, are taught therapeutics, the intention of which are to manage the condition. Most naturopaths, we focus on the body as a healing machine and recognize that if you give it the all natural materials it needs, the herbals that it needs, and you take away from the body, those things that are bad, that impact ill health, those are the things that we need to do to maintain good health. Your body's a fantastic healing machine. Let's give it the raw materials it needs. Your body knows how to fix itself. It wants to fix itself. It's trying to fix itself. And it's the holistic physician's job to support that. And nobody does that better than Dr. Walker. At the end of the day, we are not drug-based beings, but we are vitamin-based beings, and mineral-based beings, and protein-based beings, and oxygen-based beings, and water-based beings. He believes in you taking your health into your own hands, and he wants you to have every bit of information you need to make a decision. You know, sir, I don't even know you, but I'm gonna save your life. You, you know this will take 25 years off your life? Busted! Are you kidding me? The biggest misconception about Dr. Wallach is that he's just like, he's just a quack, like he's just crazy. And he's like a heretic. They use these types of words, but they're using it not because of his knowledge. They're using it because of how he behaves. But here's the thing, it's no different than us. It's just that most of us, meaning 99.9999% of us, don't have a sense of purpose and mission like he does. And you want him that way because the greatest leaders of this world have been that way. And they have been the ones who has been able to transform society and made an impact. I think rebels are passionate people and Dr. Wallach certainly fits that bill. I think you have to have a little something burning in your heart uh, if you're going to improve health around the world. Yes thought process is so forward that people sometimes think it's a little insane what he's saying or that there isn't truth to what he's saying. But he proves everything with research. If people took time to really understand, then they would see how simple his message is and how much common sense there is in it. The first time I met Dr. Wallach, I really didn't understand him. I didn't know how to take him. And because I had never been involved with a person like that who was sincerely passionate about what he did. He's only seen as this man who's on a mission, traveling 300, 350 days a year. Where's his personal time? Where's his family time? Where are all those things? But we make those moments count when he is home. And the misconception is, is that he's all about work and nothing can be further from the truth. He really is about having a great life and having a very full life. I uh, have four wonderful children, eight wonderful grandkids, and four wonderful great-grandkids. They're all very healthy because they've been taking the 90 cents of nutrients before they were conceived, all through the pregnancies they were developed in. And so I'm very, very proud of their good health. My father, he is like a child that never grew up because he's just constantly going, he's constantly learning. And we've all known children, they are excited about life. They go, 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 go until they finally just collapse and, you know, they just crash. And, you know, uh, much like my 10 year old, you know, he'll go and go and go until he just is exhausted. And my father still does that. If we just eat well, why do we need to supplement? If we just eat well, do everything right, why do we need to supplement? Well, this goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago when the universal fuel was wood. And when you burn the wood, the carbon in the wood, 95 to 98% of what's left, that powder or, or the minerals that they would put the wood ashes into the garden as a fertilizer. And then we ate the plants. Unknowingly, we were getting supplemental minerals by fertilizing with wood ashes. Well, this went on until Three o'clock in the afternoon, Monday, September 4th, 1882. Thomas Edison pulled the switch in the first commercial electric generating plant. Within 10 years, every town, every municipality, and every city in the industrialized world converted from what is the universal fuel to electricity. But they didn't know they were getting their nutritional minerals from the wood ashes. How many minerals are left over every morning when you fill your home with electricity? Zero. We do have an organic, non-GMO movement, but Organic fruits and vegetables raised in a soil that's nutritionally dead when it comes to minerals is still nutritionally dead. A farmer is not going to get paid to put additional minerals into his soil. He only is going to get benefit from putting fertilizer on his crops because that's, that's the cheapest way to get bushels per acre. 
even when you think you're eating really, really healthy, you're still probably not getting all of the nutrition that you need. And the reason why that is, is because the nutrition that you're getting is dependent on the nutrition that you're taking in, which is dependent on the foods that you're eating, which is dependent on the soils that those foods were being grown in. You're not getting the nutrients even from that organic pesticide-free broccoli because the soil that it's grown in is not cared for. U.S. Senate Document 264, published in 1936, they said 85% of our farm soils are totally depleted of minerals. It's because there's no more wood ashes and there's no more silt from floods. Now, here come Dow Chemical and Monsanto. They got the greatest idea, we'll come up with fertilizers. Plants only need three nutrients, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So all their commercial fertilizer, NPK. Carrots are beautiful, beans are, are beautiful. Tomatoes, everything you grow with these fertilizers these are beautiful, but they only have three elements in them. And you're 57 chart if you don't supplement. Now I do have to give some credit to my agricultural professor, William Albrecht from the University of Missouri. He was an icon. Dr. Albrecht uh, developed not only the first theory and popularized it, that just because you have two oranges doesn't mean they have the same nutrient content. And he also popularized the, the idea and the theory that uh, just because um, uh, something is grown in, in the soil or on the ground doesn't mean it's the same as that same thing grown somewhere else in different soil, that uh, nutrients aren't the same in, in all places. His last name now is actually the most common and popular uh, soil science quality scale. It's called the Albrecht scale. And the Albrecht scale is the rating of the healthfulness of agriculture soil. As a student in the Department of Agriculture, um, on the weekends, everybody else is out uh, going to drink beer, and I was blessed to be with uh, Professor William Albrecht, uh, who is the legend when it came to minerals in the soil. And we would uh, be in his uh, experimental fields, and uh, we would just sit there and squat in the dust. And for four years, uh, he was my mentor, my personal mentor, and it was one of the best times of my life to spend those four years with him, because I really, really began to understand minerals in the earth. Dr. Wallach's brilliant insight was, was he noticed because of the way we farm, because of processing, because of soil depletion, we weren't getting the micronutrients to channel all that energy into the right chemical reactions. So we were functionally the starving obese. There's no minerals uh, coming out of the uh, fertilizer program. In the crust of the earth, we can find over 75 different minerals. And this is the value of supplementation. What individuals need to understand that if they want to get the nutrition that they need, then they're going to need to take enhanced nutrition in the form of supplementation. When it comes to health and wellness and nutrition, that Dr. Wallach had to shock the world with a simple one-liner. Dead doctors don't lie. I've been giving lectures for eight years before that. Dead doctors don't lie. That would be a great title for this audio cassette tape and immediately skyrocketed. And they actually sold 158 million copies of that audio cassette tape. It was life-changing for people. Um, you know, the message itself around supplementing, nobody had talked about it like that. Everybody, you know, when you talk about supplementation, people say, oh, I take my vitamins or whatever, my one a day. And, um, but nobody was talking about the 90 essential nutrients. And nobody was talking about the fact that, you know, multiple diseases can occur because of, um, uh, deficiencies and that cassette tape and then later the, the book laid it out so succinctly that it was life-changing for people. We think that the formula to health is something incredibly complicated and he's really simplified it into understanding that if you give the body certain elements, minerals, vitamins, amino acids, essential fatty acids, then the body is going to take those resources and create a better body. It was amazing because it was originally two and a half hours, and yet people found it so interesting. The information, they were so hungry for the information, it became a phenomenon around the world. It got translated into numerous languages. And so the book is really a continuation of that two to two and a half hour lecture, really filling in the rest of the story. He was an advocate for salting your food to taste. He was uh, always a proponent of good fats and an opponent against uh, oils, like vegetable oils and margarine. This is at a time that 
butter was a villain. Healthy fats were villainized. Food scientists and food lobbyists were advocating for vegetable oils, margarine, not butter, uh, not uh, eggs, not salt, not things that were more natural. My father was always an advocate for things that are more natural. These are simple things that, that he was advocating on that audio tape that he then filled in the rest of the story in the book. The whole world has flipped to where this is not controversial information anymore. It's common mainstream information. And today he's been proven right. Dead Doctors Don't Lie is the most uh, widely distributed health lecture in history. Uh, one of the gratifying things today is, of course, is to see that uh, the issues that I've brought uh, forth uh, based on those 20,000 autopsies, uh, which flew in the face of the belief at the time uh, that I was quite correct and that um, now everybody is going the right direction and I feel gratified that uh, all that effort was worth it. The reality is my father is a type A plus 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 personality. He sleeps very little uh, per night. Uh, he writes his books on uh, you know uh, flights and he makes good use of his time. Uh, he is very passionate, he's very driven. Epigenetics is all of my clinical work and all the continuing science Genetics will determine your eye color, your hair color, your skin color. As soon as the sperm fertilizes the eggs, your genetics will determine if you're an XX female or an XY male. But it was an overextension of this exciting new field of genetics. It's epigenetics. That is how an environmental factor, including nutrition, or the lack of nutrition, but also environmental factors like pollution and what a developing fetus encounters, whether it's lack of nutrients, adequate nutrition, chemical exposure, good clean water or bad water. Epigenetics is replacing genetics because epigenetics says that your genes, your DNA, your RNA, and your telomeres requires 16 minerals, 16 vitamins, 12 amino acids, 3 fatty acids, uh, 90 essential nutrients. As I began to lecture around the world on the subject of um, epigenetics and starting to downplay genetics. This began to draw fire from the pharmaceutical industry, from the government, from the FDA. At the time, it was uninteresting. Nutrition uh, was uninteresting to uh, science uh, and scientists in general. They were sure that uh, genetics, that bacteria, that viruses, that pharmaceutical drugs held the answer, that DNA held the answer. DNA holds part of the answer. Today, epigenetics is the hottest topic in the field of scientific research because it holds the key. It holds the key to everything. But the, the challenge with epigenetics is that uh, there are so many possibilities. He's never been tied to a certain set of research or a food company or a drug company or uh, the dollar. He's just been committed to his heart and what he knew. The one thing that people should understand about Dr. Wallach is he is not gonna be stopped. He's not gonna be stopped by the FDA. No one wants to take on the FDA. <laughs> no one wants to go through that battle. Dr. Joel Wallach has triggered a health freedom revolution in the United States and really around the world. The Deshaies Act was actually a congressional act um, that stood in the way of doctors having the sole right to prescribe vitamins and minerals. Uh, Clinton Miller, who is the sort of cutting edge person for the National Health Association uh, and Char Murphy and I, uh, the three of us would collect petitions at our various events uh, like four times a year. And we would bring these petitions to uh, actual committees in Congress and say, hey, uh, you can't make vitamins, minerals, prescriptions. That's like saying you're gonna make an egg a prescription item here. And so people have to have the right to get these things themselves without having to get a prescription from a doctor. Of course, doctors didn't like that. Uh, they, so they actually had uh, uh, um, charges brought against us and have people arrested. We were always chased by uh, detectives and watched and so forth. Well, since 1994, when the Deshaies Act was passed, there's never gonna be a possibility where somebody's gonna have to go to a doctor and ask for a prescription for vitamin A and vitamin C and selenium and so forth. And we're very gratified about that. And that, uh, if anything's worth, a you know, lifetime's worth of work, that alone is worth it. So until Deshea was passed in 1994, supplement companies couldn't make disease risk reduction claims about their products or their ingredients. Our whole goal in enacting the the health claim petition process, which is now available through the FDA, was to be able to educate consumers on the benefits of these nutrients and these products. With help of people like Jonathan Emore and certainly people like my father, this is now available to supplement companies to be able to file health claim petitions to be able to better educate the general public.
consumers can read a, a label on a dietary supplement and understand what the product's good for and the science behind it. The Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, followed by the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, were indispensable to opening the door to health freedom in the United States. Without those acts passage, it would have been very difficult to get where we are today. So some of the successes that have come about because of the First Amendment litigation and also the change in the statutory law are omega-3 fatty acids reducing the risk of coronary heart disease, folic acid reducing the risk of neural tube defect births, selenium reducing the risk of cancers, antioxidant vitamins reducing the risk of cancers, and on and on. So since the victory in Pearson versus Shalala, where we were allowed for the first time in American history to communicate the information that folic acid reduces the risk of neural tube defect births when in supplement form, uh, the incidence of neural tube defect births in this country has gone way down. So when you submit the information around a health claim petition, it's not a simple process. It's very detailed. You have to accumulate all of the known science, the good, the science that doesn't necessarily support your claim, and the neutral uh, science associated with the, the nutrients that you're submitting the claims for. Ultimately, we wound up working with Dr. Gerhard Schrauser, a longtime mentor of my father's, the, the most notable and accomplished author of, of and researcher of selenium uh, information and research. We also, at the FDA's request, sent Dr. Philip Wanger, another professor very knowledgeable in trace elements, selenium in particular, as well as Jonathan Emore to the FDA to educate them on the benefits of uh, selenium and the science associated with the, the claims that we had submitted. Ultimately, the FDA approved our health claim petition and the associated claims such as uh, selenium may produce an anti-carcinogenic effect in the body and may reduce the risk of certain cancers. If there weren't Dr. Joel Wallach, for example, we would not have been able to produce these results. It takes a person who is a firebrand like Wallach to explode the barriers, blow them up, get them out of the way, because he's insistent on our rights. He's insistent on gaining freedom that will allow us to communicate this life-saving information. So once the health claim petition is authorized, we don't get to patent that information, we don't get to trademark that information. Uh, it's available to any company that has that particular nutrient in their products. And the whole goal was to educate the general public, was not to, to patent that information or copyright it. It was to make it available to the general public and to help everybody with their health through that process. Our government and the medical system says our children will be the first generation of Americans that do not live as long as their parents. What a terrible projection. And of course, um, I'm not going to allow that to happen. Uh, we'll work day and night, we will work our fingernails off, but we're not gonna let that happen. Doc has been fighting these types of battles throughout his career. One of the covers of Time had two fried eggs and bacon and a frowny face. And the whole message was do not eat eggs, do not eat butter, and and it was this big move to uh, margarine. And Doc, of course, in that same time, was like putting the stop sign up saying, no, 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 we eat eggs. In fact, we eat a lot of them. We eat butter, we don't eat margarine. And he's fighting that fight. People thought he was insane because the whole world, and heck, the cover of Time, was chatting about, no, 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 this is the message. And here he is swimming upstream again, 20-something years. And on the cover of Time, the eggs are back on. It's a smiley face now, and we're supposed to be eating butter, and it's not controlled to heart disease. What gives him that unique perspective and had the opportunity to, have, to do thousands of autopsies on animals, there are not many physicians who have the opportunity to do 15, 20, 100 autopsies. Dr. Wallach has done thousands of autopsies. You get a totally different perspective about what's going on in the human body when you can actually see it, and you see it at the time of autopsy. I remember it vividly, him telling me that it would take probably 100 years before science caught up and gave him credibility for that. Now, I think we're, I think we're mostly there. People that I've met have never, ever put 24-7 for 30 years into one thing that they fervently believed in, like Dr. Wallach and his mission for nutrition for the planet. He's had a huge part in really just opening people's minds to the, the possibilities and you know, really broadening that horizon when it comes to, to health and wellness and, and better health through better nutrition. 
things where he was getting fired for 30 years ago, ago now he's winning awards for. Receiving that Klaus Schwartz Award uh, was a justification and a support of my findings, which is an award given to health professionals who do very unique work in trace element research. And um, I was the first um, naturopathic physician to get it. Usually had been given to medical doctors who were medical doctors and PhD in either biochemistry or pathology. Here's the experts in biochemistry of the world saying my findings were um, not only correct, but useful. Dr. Wallach's work was said to be a joke and that he didn't know what he was talking about. Now the United Nations is inviting him to speak and they're validating what he's saying. There was a philosopher named uh, Arthur Schopenhauer and he's famous for saying, all new ideas are first ridiculed, then fought, and then accepted. He is on a mission and he has this vision of exactly how it needs to be. He doesn't change. It's always who can we help? How can we help them? Dr. Wallach, he still does 300 lectures out of the year, does typically five days a week, two hours of radio. When he's doing this radio show, he's typically sitting in a hotel room on the telephone with a headset and it's all coming out of his head. He doesn't have someone feeding him answers like there's other people out there saying this is the answers you should do. I don't think people realize that. They all think, oh, he's looking in a book or something like that. No, it's just his knowledge. I have seen this guy in the course of one day do four hours of live radio, two hours of television interviews, a three hour seminar, travel two hours in the car, and be on the phone every minute talking to people that called him on the cell phone to ask him about a particular malady that somebody they knew were dealing with. This guy is 24 seven committed to human beings. Our bodies are designed to maintain health. Healthy is normal, people forget that, that a healthy state is a normal state. Everybody always thinks that it's just be, it's so, it's so difficult or it's so complex or you have to be so perfect. It, you, it doesn't take much for you to be nutritionally sound, but what it does take is it takes consistency. I believe that the human being has the capacity to live well beyond 120. We have the capacity to, and this is epigenetic, because given the right raw materials, our cells will repair themselves forever. Today, the vast majority of people understand, including the medical world, understands that we need good access to a baseline of, of nutrients, but certainly minerals. We can't live without minerals. Humans would, would cease to exist if we had no access to minerals. It became that message that we need to supplement and for them to understand that our farming practices, our uh, environmental and ecological practices have negatively affected our access to just the basic nutrition. This is where my father's 90 essential nutrients message comes from, is that it's a baseline of trace minerals, including ultra trace minerals, so really a baseline of ultra trace, trace and major minerals is the key. That's the foundation. You can't build a house that's gonna last without a good foundation. You can't build a, 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 a great uh, you know, human body without a baseline of minerals. So I go around and give lectures all over the world. People every month come up to me and tell me how I saved their lives, how the information saved their mother, how it saved their kids. You cannot pay for that. You cannot pay for that. That's worth everything.
Good boy.